one of the things we've been contemplating at FDA is like ultimately, could you imagine the um, application on your phone that allows you to scan peaches wow. and understand did the peaches have a full supply chain that we can monitor? So thank you so much for joining us. Terrific to be here. Hello. So, you know, in thinking about how to start this, I was thinking about the origins of the FDA. So the FDA started in 1906, 113 years ago. And uh, it's interesting to think about that time because, you know, it's turn of the previous century, a time of a lot of tumult, innovation, technical change, um, an industrial revolution, you know, things that actually really were the driving forces to create the FDA. And like, here we are, another turn of the century, another industrial revolution, another amount of uh, tumultuous change. You know, what are the needs of the FDA right now? And, you know, is its core mission really still relevant? <laughs> is the FDA still relevant? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to go back uh, that 113 years and the time the FDA was formed and continues to be the largest consumer protection agency. It was formed out of 100 laws. Um, I think that the issue that was going on at the time was unhygienic conditions in the Chicago stockyard. And you can imagine there's been a lot of responsibilities of the FDA over time, thalidomide, et cetera. But practically speaking, the FDA is responsible as a science-based agency to protect and promote public health, including through making sure that we have safe and effective medical products to use every day with our patients, as well as through promoting innovation. You know, your question uh, was whether or not the FDA is still relevant. Yes. And, and I would argue that in a time of rapidly emerging biology, when we've got more and more scientific innovations and potential products coming to bear, the need to make sure that we have an objective way of assessing safety and effectiveness and providing co consumer confidence that this treatment is appropriate for me uh, is a responsibility of the FDA that actually has more responsibility, not less. Well, so, you know, in that context, let's talk about what the FDA looks like today. In those older days, you know, the data came to the FDA by the truckload. Yeah. You know, I'm just imagining like reams and reams of paper and so on. And, you know, and I'm just curious to get your take for, you know, what does the current system look like? And, you know, could you take us through, you know, how this works? So, you know, a couple of things. I actually think that there was a time when it probably came on horse and buggy, not yes, just trucks. Yes, yes. Um, so practically speaking, I usually think about five key elements um, in drug and biologic um, product development. So there's the discovery phase, then there's time of preclinical development. After you've done uh, adequate preclinical development in line with good laboratory practice, then you'd submit an investigational new drug application for a drug or a biologic um, to the FDA, which gives permission then to start clinical studies um, with people. And a drug or biologic will go through a series of clinical studies, typically phase one through three, although these days those lines are blurring for exactly what, what drugs followed then by a new drug application or biologics application of BLA to the FDA. And then the final stage after FDA marketing approval would be post-marketing assessment and continuous surveillance um, about this particular medical product. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the usual steps. Given that, you know, what would you want to modernize about it? You know, um, how do you take us into the next hundred years? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I think that goes back to the horse and buggy in the trucks yeah. and how information has historically gotten to the FDA. Um, so I came from the landscape of a health tech startup company focused on data. I was recruited to FDA with the expectation that I was going to show up and focus specifically on digital innovation for the FDA and sort of went smashing into a, a um, realization that, in fact, the way the majority of our applications still come in is through PDFs or sort of essentially large digital representations of what used to come in on trucks. Um, we now receive most of our drug applications, but not all, um, in some kind of electronic format. As a matter of fact, just uh, two weeks ago, I had to approve a um, book of work um, in orphan diseases where we're still getting things on paper as one example. But most things come in as a digital application, also with some digital data, but that gets stored at FDA. and. As I think about where we're going in the future, practically speaking, in order to become more efficient FDA, we're going to need to receive more and more of those applications in digital formats 
that start to represent structured data, structured data that we can review at scale, and also structured data that allows us to now continuously surveil medical products in a better way in the future. And so what I realized was that if I was going to be a person focused on data at FDA, I was going to need to also think about how do we modernize the FDA's underlying infrastructure to take that forward, and that's why I took on the CIO job. Yeah, and in addition to the infrastructure, it's interesting to think about uh, the culture. And because, for example, if there's a great drug that um, uh, that nobody ever gets, you know, nobody ever knows about it. Let's say let's say there was a cure to cancer, but the FDA didn't approve it. There's no outcry because uh, no one ever knew about it. But on the other hand, if the FDA lets something through that actually you know has harmful effects, you know, thalidomide and other classic examples, then you know then there's a huge backlash. You know, how do you build and how do you innovate in a culture that has to deal with such strong asymmetries? So it's, it's interesting, as you describe those asymmetries, what you all are describing is the practical reality that that can make you very risk adverse, right? Yes, exactly. Particularly worried that I'm gonna do something wrong and I'm gonna flub up and that's actually gonna have very public um, impact. And, and, and we see that all the time. Uh, I think that in order to develop solutions for regulatory innovation, then what you really have to do is come up with flexible mechanisms that also allow us to deal with the risks, but also um, take some risks when appropriate. And so that means that as FDA, one of the things we focus on is risk-based scientific decision-making and trying to right-size the degree of review and expectation with the potential risk of this particular product. And what do I mean by risk? Um, sometimes those are safety risks, right? So the risk of, for example, hepatic failure or the risk uh, that this drug might uh, take a person's life. Sometimes the risks of the size of the population impacted. So you're trying to balance the urgency of this particular problem sitting in front of you with the number of people who, where this product may impact um, also, there's risks of public perception and, and, and expectation. And then the last sort of set of risks is where can you de-risk it? Exactly. So you can de-risk it by um, trying to make sure that, for example, preconditions are met as it relates to the manufacturing process. You can de-risk it by understanding in a consistent way toxicity. You can de-risk it by having consistent expectations around clinical effectiveness. You know, so I, I think what's interesting is to think about that in even the other context of what the FDA does, I think people often don't realize that the FDA isn't just about, let's say, approving drugs. We think about clinical trials. There's a lot of things that you do to protect um, uh, American consumers. And you know, when we're talking about it, it's almost like, you know, I feel like you could have a show that's like CSI FDA or something like that, um, where you have these investigations of the crises. So like, you know, like sometimes it's slow moving crises, like the opioid epidemic. Um, how do you, like for a crisis like that, where it slowly sneaks up on us and then it's too late. You know, how does the FDA even think about that? Practically speaking, the FDA is responsible for many types of medical products. And yeah. any one of those can have a crisis, I've discovered. Mm -hmm. So we have food and drugs. We have biologics and devices. We have animal food and drugs. We have cosmetics. We have... Um, nicotine-based products, vapes. Um, and, and so yeah. the distribution of potential crises um, are, are real. And as you think about something like the opioid crisis, um, a, a problem that snuck up on us in, in many different ways. Uh, and as I step back, and I came to the FDA in March, so I've had sort of the opportunity to watch this as an insider-outsider um, during this period of time. You know, as information starts to accumulate that says we've got a really big problem here, that information comes from the public, it comes from across different places in government, and now we need to step back as a nation but as also as an agency and say what do we formally do? And so as an agency, we put in place um, an action plan that had several parts that focus on what we're responsible for, and I'm gonna come back mm -hmm. to that key yeah. point in just a second, but then also asked how does that interdigitate with all the other plans that are going on across government and also across the healthcare setting to, to try and solve for. So I'll, I'll say the last piece that I, I found very interesting since I've been in government um, is that there are very clear rules of the road of our authorities. It took me a while to get used to that word, but the word so would which be word? authorities. Authorities, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so our areas of responsibility and sort of legitimate jurisdiction. And practically speaking, as 
uh, with respect to the opioid crisis, we need to go back and say, where as FDA do we have authority to try and help resolve this problem? So practically speaking, we can help reduce the number of opioid tablets, for example, a patient has access to after back surgery or knee surgery in order to reduce the chance that this particular person has access and becomes addicted in the first place. As a second example, we can increase methods for access for, for example, naloxone-based treatments in the field. And we've done a number of projects to try and make sure that um, there is patient-informed labeling and yeah. other aspects in the field. And then also we can start to think about developing and helping to develop new treatments for the treatment of pain as well as new treatments for the treatment of addiction and start to solve a problem on that side. So as FDA, we have to stick in our swim lanes, but then we have to think about how that grooves with everything else across government so that there's more of a nationwide approach. Yeah, in that sense of being uh, handling the, the authority nature of things, like, you know, you've got to make some tough decisions, like even things like contaminated food going across the border, like you've got to inspect trucks. How do you know which truck to look for? I mean, yeah, how so, you know, as I got to the agency, I was surprised to find um, not only are we responsible for regulating about, um, you know, 20 percent of international GDP, uh, as I mentioned, that sort of across a broad number of products. And the weed that we regulate is different by product. So about 15% of, of our, our food is imported. We need to be able to make sure that the food is appropriately safe. It's appropriately labeled, that it's um, legitimate for sale in this country. And so that means that if you're sitting at the border of Mexico, we need to in basically investigate trucks that are coming across the border and look for violative products that aren't appropriate for sale in the United States, either for safety concerns or, or commercial concerns. How do you know which truck to look at? Yeah. Um, and if we don't get that right, we can basically stop traffic for miles. So we have, um, in the case of inspecting trucks, we have something called the PREDICT program. And the PREDICT program is a 10 years old rules engine that's been written by uh, some of the different centers across FDA where the rules start to predict which truck is most likely to have unsafe food. Now you can imagine that if we wrote those rules 10 years ago, <laughs> they might be old rules. Yes. And it's true that we update the rules every year, but we do so by hand. And as I think about trying to develop a more modern agency, can't we update yeah the way that we modernize those rules. And so right now we've got an experiment going on where we're looking at machine learning based prediction of which trucks we should inspect on the border. And can we now use machine learning as a way um, to, to be smarter? Importantly though, going back to your point about mm -hmm. we can't get it wrong yes. because we lose consumer confidence when we get it wrong. We can't just say machine learning is gonna be great, let's go. We actually have mm -hmm. to thoughtfully do the experiments to say, if we apply a new approach over the old rules engine, are we going to now be able to improve our inspection on the border? Yeah, no, I think it's fascinating to imagine that there is this world where the FDA is doing deep learning, machine learning to be able to, to do this. You know, I, I, I think perhaps also we underestimate maybe cases where maybe you have averted crises that we never heard of. You know, those may be the best TV shows. I mean, are there any <laughs> cases like that? As you were saying this, I was trying to come up with some crises I could talk about. That was actually <laughs> what I was thinking. So, you know, here's one that I just recently learned about. I think we're all very worried about drug shortages. I'm an oncologist by yeah. background. I practiced in academia. Um, I, I took care of adults, but um, certainly uh, when we think about children with leukemia, one of the drugs that, that's currently um, in shortage is, is a leukemia drug for, for mm -hmm. pediatric leukemia. And um, we try and think through how do we help avert drug shortages. And in 2018, we had something north of 50 drug shortages. But the little known secret is that we helped to avert over 160 drug shortages. That's because practically speaking, we have developed a whole staff focused on drug shortages. We've tried to start to figure out ways to predict what is going to cause a drug shortage and try and intervene beforehand, speaking directly to manufacturers. Yeah. It takes sometimes a while to build that muscle, right? You can imagine, we have to first understand what are the causes of drug shortages and how are we gonna go after them, but then practically speaking, once we do so, we can help to avert that crisis. I see the same kind of thing right mm -hmm. now in foodborne outbreaks um, where uh, we have a call every morning at 9 a.m. where we're sort of talking about the things that worry us for the day. I've 
officially stopped eating. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> because, that's not good news for any of us. <laughs> because I'm, you know, getting very concerned about yeah. what foodborne outbreak there's going to be through the day. Yeah. But there's sort of like this continuous sensing to try and avert problems yes. before they come. Yeah, fantastic. So let's change the channel. So we're watching CSI. Let's switch to a different show. Let's watch, uh, let's get into maybe something more like Star Trek. Oh. So, um, so let's talk about the future because the future that's really becoming today, and like stuff that I remember like five, ten, ten years ago were things that I thought would be sci-fi, like you know, gene therapy, gene editing, uh, CRISPR therapies. You know, um, it's kind of crazy that uh, like uh, I was actually talking with um, uh, my eldest daughter, and she was finding that you could get kits off of Amazon to do DIY CRISPR and that she could make our dog glow in the dark. Um, she liked it not to make our dog glow in the dark, but I think in the end, I think uh, it was just crazy that this is the world that we're living in. And so, you know, there's two sides of this to, to dive into. So maybe the first side is, um, like, we'll get to kids and, and dogs glowing in the dark in a second, but like, uh, for thinking about the clinical side of this, you know, how does the FDA think about uh, something like CRISPR? Because it's both gene editing, it, it's a therapy, there's a delivery aspect, um, you know, there's, does this live with the FDA? Does this live with the AMA, AMA? You know, how do you even start to think about people throwing these crazy new developments at you that could radically transform medicine and cure disease, but now has to really push the paradigm for the FDA in new ways? So I think one of the things um, to, to go back to is this issue of risk-based regulation. How, you know, how are we going to start to solve for this in a way that appropriately has the right regulatory paradigm for this problem at hand and aligns with um, the, the level of risk? And as I think about this space, uh, you know, I think that we are living in a space that gets closer and closer to customized or individualized therapies, the landscape of the end of one, and, and, and how do we make sense of that? And practically speaking, in order to get there, you have to have some kind of framework that you apply that, doesn't, that says, all right, before we talk about CRISPR specifically or anti um, sense new, um, uh, oligonucleotides you know before we talk about any specific thing like what's the framework when we're going to uh, apply and, and how do we do so in, in a risk based way yes and practically speaking that includes what do we know about safety what do we know about safety in vivo and in vitro in the in animals and in the petri dish what do we know uh, about biological plausibility it, you know what's our understanding from a biology perspective that this would indeed work in the way that we would expect it to work. What do we have in terms of a predefined set of expectations in terms of clinical outcomes mm -hmm. that we can monitor in a objective way to understand whether or not this intervention is making the difference that we expect it to make? Also, what do we need to think about with respect to whether or not this is going to apply just to one individual person, or we might now start to apply and scale th this approach across multiple individuals? And that's actually going to start to balance how much risk we're going to take for this particular yeah. scenario. What can we think about consistency in manufacturing? And, and, and manufacturing, I think, starts to become more and more of an issue um, across this space. And then practically speaking, what are the ethics? Like, what, what's going to happen in the clinic, we may not be responsible in our authorities for ethics, but I think we're responsible for at least consciously thinking about what's going to go on. So as, as I think about this space of incredible new therapies coming forward, you, we all need frameworks that we can apply and where every one of us can look at through a different lens and say, I can understand why that's the order and that's how we're going to start to work our way through it. Well, so let's drill down a little deeper because the end of one framework sounds like mind-boggling from a therapeutic point of view, but maybe there's actually um, presence, you know, so if you think about surgeries, like heart surgeries are all kind of N equals one, people are different, there's some similarities, uh, you know, and, um, you know, perhaps we're starting to look at things like CAR-T not just as, um, actually I should back up, so CAR-T is uh, in this sci-fi category. You take um, T cells out of your body, out of your blood, you re-engineer them uh, to make them sort of supercharged and you put them back into the patient. And the results of that are just mind boggling that tumors can melt away within days and people are just literally cured of cancer. Um, and so, you know, CAR-T has sort of biopharma aspect. Maybe it has like a sense of doing molecular surgery, mm -hmm. you know, like um, in these N equals one cases. So I'm curious to get your sense, like N equals one is not completely unprecedented. Um, but you know, what are the things that we need to do to bring it into the future? 
So, so you know, n not only is N of one not precedented, if we kind of go back across medicine across time, we actually really started off as N of one medicine and became more quantitative across time, especially as we had interventions that were applicable to populations, including the, in the millions. So, so practically speaking, we do have frameworks for N of one therapies. Um, you mentioned surgery. Another one, you know, in the landscape that I came from in cancer medicine was bone marrow or stem cell transplant, right? These, these are places where we needed to first have the scientific innovation that goes along with biological plausibility to start to figure out how we're going to move forward with new techniques and th treatments about what to do, but then start to apply a systematized set of expectations about how to refine this and get it right. So if I go back to bone marrow transplant, you know, we started to develop refined processes to understand which patient was appropriate for transplant, where do we manage them in the hospitals, ultimately we went to the home, how are we gonna do that, what's the actual therapy as well as supportive therapies are going around, including supportive therapy for the family. Um, and we slowly but surely worked our way through not only the individual treatment, but also all the processes that we needed to go along. And I think what you're gonna see in, for example, cell therapy and many of these other places is that not only do we develop N of one, activities where we say biological plausibility and safety and good manufacturing and um, it, you know, effectiveness, but we also start to refine how they perform in a greater scenario or greater system of care. Yeah. And we've seen that happen over and over again across time. So, you know, getting back to this genie out of the bottle, the fact that you can get these CRISPR kits, you know, on Amazon, uh, and actually, literally, you can YouTube this. There's like some guy that has a bunch, like 15 glowing dogs. Uh, um, you know, what, how do you think about that when people can do things like that, you know, in their home? How do you think about, uh, what, what should the FDA do about things like that? So, you know, it goes back to this issue of authorities and, and, and sort of where, where's our, you know, core responsibility and, and how we need to move things forward. You know, practically speaking, we're responsible for thinking about medical products that are now going into commercial, yeah. um, commercial use and specifically for now the treatment of medical product problems or sort of justifiable claims. So the individual patient who's buying it off the internet, um, injecting it into their side, it gets into this very fuzzy area of yeah. exactly what are, our what, what are our authorities. And, and I think that becomes now really much more of a national conversation around rights and privacy mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, FDA approval of the kit. Um, yes. and, and practically speaking, if the kit was going to be approved for commercial purposes with claims and labeling, et cetera, that's when it starts to get into the FDA perspective. It gets really murky when, um, we, when we live in this landscape of the internet without claims. Um, you know, we see that pop up, not just in CRISPR kits, but CBD mm -hmm. and vaping. Like, there's yeah. a lot of other places. And, um, you know, that's why I kind of went back to that point around authorities. Like, there's yes. sort of, like, really clear guidelines of what does the law say? And then, like, as you move, move out, how do we think about that? So, and, you know, maybe the ultimate sci-fi example of thinking about um, FDA into new areas are that, you know, even algorithms themselves you know, can have therapeutic or diagnostic value. And you know, how do you think about how, um, sort of regulating uh, these algorithms themselves as they change and go through revisions and have impact on how we make this either clinical decisions or even our therapies themselves? So this is a really important area of, again, new regulatory paradigms and really trying to figure out, like, how do we do this? And, and as I think about algorithms um, and the regulatory paradigms around them. So first of all, I tend to divide this into two main categories. Algorithms that have a responsibility of acting as a medical treatment. So essentially software as a medical device. And there, there's a risk-based paradigm that asks the question, does this particular software product um, ultimately basically take the place of the judgment of the physician and ultimately now make a clinical decision on the physician's behalf without the physician intervening. And depending on whether or not that's gonna happen, then there's a differing set of expectations in terms of the, develop the development of the regulatory paradigm. There's a couple of issues though that, that goes along with this. One is that um, as software can update so quickly, developing regulatory pa paradigms that allow also, update cycles that keep pace with software update cycles is one of the things that, as FDA, we're working on. Yeah, actually, is that even possible? I mean, because you know, people can update software, obviously, very quickly. 
So, so this is this is something that, as FDA, we we've been you know, speaking publicly about um, quite a bit. Can we come up with essentially preconditions for software updates, yeah. so that if there are strong quality controls in the way software is developed, well understood um, product performance as yeah. it expect uh, in terms of the expectation of the updates, can you now have algorithm updates um, that that are um, as expected and don't require the same level um, of review. And so that's something that we're certainly th spending a lot of time working on as through a series of pilot projects. Also, the other part of what you've just mentioned in terms of our sci-fi land mm -hmm. is that practically speaking, software and algorithms are actually also innovating all across the spectrum of life sciences and healthcare just outside of what we regulate. So it may not necessarily be a software product that's acting as a um, diagnostic or a treatment activity, but it's a software product that's intended to support life sciences more globally, whether that's to make clinical trials more efficient, to match patients to clinical trials, to curate data, to help um, do workflow in the hospital. And all of those kinds of software products, we don't directly regulate, but importantly, those products also need some good signals of here's what good looks like yeah. and here's how you should think about good software controls in those settings as well. You know, actually one bit of news that came up was uh, Google purchasing a, a huge amount of healthcare data. Yeah. And, and, and data and, and, and understanding how that gets regulated is, I would think, would also be a really um, tough question. I mean, how do you think about, uh, you know, how these new kinds of data that people are generating and then new, new people who want to get access to that you know, how does the FDA think about ownership of the data, privacy, and you know, what are the opportunities there and the challenges? I thought you were going to go there in this session. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, so data ownership and privacy. So I, there's an easy way for me to get out of this is the FDA, which is that practically speaking, when the, the data comes to the FDA, yeah. it's the... Um, much, much of the data that comes to the FDA is the proprietary information and yeah. confidential information that belongs to the co company, and, and so we treat it as confidential information. And then there's other information that we use, for example, for drug surveillance and those kind of things that are sort of more um, publicly available data sets. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I think that the, the, FDA, the easy FDA answer is we don't have a lot of things that we specifically have to worry about. Yeah. But in my CIO role, I just recently started pushing on the fact that I really think we need a chief privacy role um, at FDA, which we don't currently That's have. Interesting. And when I, when I brought this up, um, people said, well, you know, we, the, the data that comes to us is de-identified. We're, you know, this is not the problem um, that we're really living in. But, you know, if we go back to what prompted the question, which is, uh, you know, with the Ascension data and what's going on right now in the Google story, I, you know, I think practically speaking, our laws of the past, HIPAA, really contemplated a different world than yes. we live in right now, whereby essentially in 2019 and going forward, it's very hard to maintain privacy of any individual. And not, maybe even hard to de-anonymize. It, it's it really very hard to de-anonymize. Yeah. And, and it's not just genomics data, yeah. right? The, the longitudinal story of your healthcare, every single time you visited the doctor, how much medicine you received, whether or not um, you got an additional test such an e, as an EKG, you know, that pattern is your unique footprint as well. Yes. And so there's lots of different ways that data these days actually has a, has a unique um, and representative pattern that really is, is ind individual to you. And I think, you know, the reason I brought this up at FDA as a chief privacy officer is that I, I think practically speaking, even information that is de-identified from a HIPAA perspective actually still is probably re-identifiable yeah. even in our context. And we need to be starting to think about what does that mean now and in the future. And, and also, you know, what are some of the creative ways that we can start to prepare? Some of it's just having the conversation. Some of it is making sure that we are absolutely fierce when it comes to security and understanding who's accessing what data for what purposes. But it's also, when do we start using, for example, synthetic data? How do we actually start to think about what new tools and techniques and tricks we can use for data in the now and in the future to preserve privacy? And I, I think that's all of our responsibility. Well, so I also wanted to talk to you about a, a different way to think about data, which is um, we could imagine in clinical trial the future that's maybe fairly different. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I don't think anybody um, disagrees, or maybe I could be wrong, that we, um, it's important for the FDA to test toxicity. You know, we don't want to put out things that are toxic. But maybe a bold thing to say is that, you know, FDA will run phase one clinical trials, will review phase one clinical trials. Um, but it, maybe we don't need phase two or three. 
maybe we, especially for maybe life-threatening diseases, um, we let real-world real evidence and payers decide efficacy, as they're going to do anyways through reimbursement. Um, and that maybe the FDA could actually pull back and, and, and data gets used differently. I think, do you think that's viable? So three things to kind of go into yeah. this that will underscore ultimately what I believe is a resounding yes. Yeah. So practically speaking, we are already starting to see new drug development paradigms in, in terms of starting to shake up their traditional phase one, phase two, phase three um, happen. Uh, and, you know, we, practically speaking, we've seen drugs approved based on phase one data. We've seen expansion cohorts all happen within the phase one setting, which is basically you now end up with phase one trials with a thousand patients on a phase yeah. one trial. That's not the way I was taught as a clinical and, trialist and sort to run of phase, phase one. Phase one slash two or something like yeah, that? There, yeah, there's some of them phase one, two. Some of them yeah. are just expansion cohorts in what's traditionally caused phase one. But, but practically speaking, I think that what we're seeing is a blurring of the phases. What we're also seeing now is contemplation of, of platform trials. We've been talking about platform trials for a while. They're really hard to pull off. They're hard to pull off because of issues of contracting and intellectual property. They're hard to pull off because the underlying infrastructure is tough, which I'll come back to. But you know, practically speaking, we, we've talked about platform trials where we can now, in one clinical trial setting, start to evaluate multiple investigational products simultaneously. We've started to say, can we um, once approving a drug, start to now use information in the real world setting, whether that is prospective or retrospective, but classically said re real world data and real world evidence to start to create a total product story or a totality of the evidence around this particular product. So I think this is the landscape we're going to. I also think that we had essentially a, um, a an accelerant put into the story in December 2016, which was 21st Century Cures. If you look underneath the hood of the 21st Century Cures legislation, what you see are a number of elements that push us in the direction of starting to accelerate our clinical evidence development process. What kind of elements? Um, so this includes starting to double down on how we think about surrogate endpoints, how we use patient reported data in the, in, the, in the process, how we actually start to understand and enable platform trials, how we now use real world evidence and, and asking FDA to get smart about when and we can confidently use real world evidence. And so I think that all of those were enabling features within 21st century cures. And now we all have a responsibility to start to figure it out. My last point around this which is that it is really hard to do because it takes putting the toe in the water and that has to happen with some company or some investigators, mm -hmm. um, you know, core uh, baby. And that actually is really hard because it's hard to want to subject your particular product that you're studying right now. It may be your only shot on goal yeah. um, in, into a clinical evidence framework that we're still trying to all figure out. And so it, I'm not surprised it's taking us a while to figure out. We have to figure out not only how to do the work of new clinical evidence development paradigms, but actually people have to be ready to participate. And it's taking us a while. You know, and it's interesting you mentioned 21st century cures. You know, I'm curious about, how, you know, to connect this to how we think about how innovations like this happen with all the political landscape that has to make it happen. And, you know, what is this interplay between politics and, and the FDA? I mean, I hear there's an election you know, coming up sometime soon, and, and that these are things that are, um, you know, it, these things turn into realities for the, the life that we all have to deal with here. It's really interesting. So if we, if we look back, um, so Medicare Modernization Act was passed in 2003, so I'll sort of use that as my starting point. If I look back to MMA in 2003, around that time, we were contemplating uh, sort of new payment and delivery models, comparative effectiveness, um, there was a report from the Institute of Medicine in 2007 around building a learning healthcare system where basically available interconnected data could help us continuously optimize both healthcare delivery but also understanding performance of drugs and devices. That piece of work from the uh, Institute of Medicine in 2007 basically said in order to pull this off, we need a digital infrastructure. And basically, you know, it was a treatise said, here's, here's what's going to happen. The reason that's so important is that then we had something really important in 2008 or so, the global financial crisis, which then led to the stimulus bill. Mm -hmm. So it was because that treatise was already ready and also came along with the point of view of we need a digital infrastructure to pull this off 
the embedded within the context of the stimulus bill, we got the High Tech Act, which led to the full-scale distribution of electronic health records. And we can all talk about electronic health records and good and bad yeah. um, points of view, but what you can see is that a big international experience, the GFC, actually then had a direct day-to-day -day result in terms of an enabling digital infrastructure in the United States um, circa 2009. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of different examples along the way, but if I then think about what was happening um, in terms of, of parallel legislation on the House and the Senate side that ultimately became 21st Century Cures, we had um, this conversation going on around innovative uh, legislation to try and accelerate the development of cures. But I don't know if many of you probably remember, it largely got put on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then we were um, moving into the election in November 2016. The election happens, and now as a country sort of in a rather tumultuous state trying to figure out what might be bipartisan, and 21st Century Cures gets pulled back off of the shelf and in December 2016 gets signed into law. And so I think, you know, again, this was a piece of legislation that was had been formed over the prior two years, a lot like that IOM report from 2007. It was yep. generally ready to go. Yep, and then and just then there was an event, and then that's what pushed it along. No, that's fascinating. Okay, so let's change the channel one more time. Uh, so let's go to Food Network. Uh, oh. So, you know, there is an F in FDA, right? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, and uh, you know, the food part, I think, is often underappreciated, uh, and so I'm curious to dive in there. And, you know, if we, or we could combine shows and talk about Star Trek on the Food Network. So one of the fascinating areas that we see is genetic engineering and synthetic biology uh, connecting to food. And, you know, you're seeing things like cultured meat, like um, meat that's never, that maybe originally the DNA came from an animal, but that what you get out of it is like filet mignon or something like that, or in principle. Uh, and, and that, um, you know, when you start to see that being created, you know, how do you even think about that? Like, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, what do you worry about? Uh, how do you balance this innovation with making sure that we're being safe? So, you know, I think these, these innovations have shaken things up a lot, right? Yeah. Um, so if we think about meat, there's a clear interplay in the United States between what's the responsibilities of the FDA what's, versus what's the responsibility of the, of the USDA. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, just in this particular space, we had to start to figure out Again, that, that language of the authorities, where, where do we appropriately say this is the part that the FDA is responsible for and, and, and sort of our unique set of science-based skills versus this is the part that the USDA sees as, as their core responsibility trying to want to make, mm -hmm. and, and to, to keep um, markets intact. And uh, last year, we um, ultimately developed um, agreements with USDA so that the parts of the um, cell culture food activity that's got to do with cell culture, for example, and and that that part of the equation ultimately became U.S. Uh, the FDA's responsibility, and then as we moved now to marketing, et cetera, it became um, USDA. And I'm not actually sure where the line got drawn, yeah. but it sort of reminds me of a couple of things. So first of all, I go back to this point of, of authorities and jurisdiction. So as new innovations come about, we have to start to figure out, do we need to change the regulatory paradigm to make sure it works? The second thing is that we also need to think about how do we make sure consumers understand what's going on? So what does labeling look like? How do we talk about this? How do we have consistent um, language? Some of you may have heard um, the, the story last year around almond milk and that almonds don't lactate. Well, you know, it's because like, <laughs> practically speaking, what's rice milk and almond milk and dairy milk? Like, you know, yeah. how, do we, how do we make sure that consumers understand what yeah. this is all about? Um, and, and so as I think about the innovations in food, mm -hmm. I also think about what does that mean in terms of the innovations and the regulatory landscape. And if we don't try and keep those two things in lockstep, we gum everything up. Well, and it's interesting because like, uh, I'm not sure there's long lines of people protesting the fact that almonds don't lactate, right? I think uh, there uh, are. <laughs> um, um, but may, yeah, it, it comes from an interesting different set of, uh, of, of incentives there, right? Yeah. And, and so it's just interesting, what do you call meat? What do you call milk? Right, what do you right, call cheese? Exactly. Um, you know, another aspect of this that I think is really fascinating is just also all the things you have to do with foodborne illnesses and just thinking about like how does the FDA sort of wrap their heads around that considering that food could be coming from anywhere and the, these, these threats are coming from anywhere. Since we're going to go back to CSI for yeah. a second. So these days, 
Uh, if there's a foodborne illness, um, we will take the bacteria and essentially do whole genome sequencing to really understand the outbreak as well as which individuals who are ill, are they all related to the same outbreak? And for example, with listeria, which particularly likes to be cold, so it, you know, it tends to get stuck on the nozzle um, in, in, the, in the plant um, and ends up in, for example, your frozen peas or, or, or other places, uh, that you know, ultimately you can trace now through whole genome sequencing the fingerprint of the listeria then all the way back to the individual who uh, had the, um, poor, the bad product um, at their local Whole Foods, for example. And so the, the ability to now trace that all the way through is, is doable through modern technology. And one of the things the FDA does in concert with CDC and now really through an international database is, have, is maintain a database of all of the different genomes so that we can also track back and, and do this more quickly. And so that's kind of where things have been going um, in the food outbreak space. The other side of it is uh, the application of technology to trying to improve our ability to go essentially farm to table. So for example, blockchain and distributed ledger technology to make sure that we can trace all the way from the farm to the grocery store. And one of the things we've been contemplating at FDA is like ultimately, could you imagine the um, application on your phone that allows you to scan peaches wow. and understand did the peaches have a full supply chain that we could we, we could uh, monitor uh, and so these are the kinds of things that are now a part of the lexicon at FDA we have a program called uh, smarter food safety and that whole book of work is, is around thinking about how do we move this field forward that's fascinating um, okay, so we just have a few minutes left, uh, and I want to take us now to the future. So we, you know, we started the discussion by talking about, you know, the FDA being you know, over 100 years old, and I know we've sort of talked about the sort of challenges and 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 the work that's been done. Thinking about let's th let's think about the next hundred years and where does that go? We're going to have new types of challenges. Um, one challenge, maybe just to throw at you to start, is that we're going to have even just a different way of thinking about disease that uh, there's all this science in the science of longevity of just what can keep us healthier longer, where it's not about treating cancer, it's not about treating Alzheimer's, it's about making sure you never get cancer or you never get Alzheimer's and all the therapeutics that would be done to expand lifespan and expand, expand healthy span. You know, that seems like just completely paradigm breaking. You know, how do you think about that? Well, so, you know, to begin with, I think that it helps us to distinguish between aspects of biological aberrants, right? Like where essentially biology, biology's gone bad and we're trying to think about treatments yeah. to fix it versus the really difficult construct that you're talking about, which is how do we essentially apply preventative approaches and have the confidence that these approaches are both safe and effective in a longitudinal frame that really is hard to contemplate because we don't know if we've ever gotten there. Um, you, it's really hard to know that this particular treatment was indeed successful for this individual. So I'm curious, you know, as you do this yeah. here, uh, this has certainly been an area of focus for you. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is also having the biomarkers that, that you can mm -hmm. to know that, you know, to your point, I think a lot of what you've been talking about is just, it's about measurement. Yep. And it's about understanding how those measurements correlate with, with a harm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I think we just need to know what to measure and, and that's work to be done. Um, but I think that the, that's, that's, uh, that's something that I think is a part of the science already. And, and I think that, you know, if, if I follow on that line of thinking, it's also about longitudinality. It's about saying, here's a surrogate or an inter intermediate set of endpoints that we're going to monitor, but we're actually going to understand longitudinally. How does that then translate to what we understand hap is happening across time? Historically, the way we've often thought about effectiveness is sort of as a fixed book of work. And I think that what you're going to see over time is we're going to talk more and more about longitudinal performance. And this is a perfect example of that. And so, you know, one last really quick question. So what does this mean for the next hundred years of the FDA? You know, um, um, what do you see? The, what's your vision for it? What, what are we going to be talking about a hundred years from now? So I think the FDA of the future is going to be far more digital and, and informed by data at all times. A lot of the activities are going to be automated so that we can focus our time and attention on the things that happen, need to happen first that we're going to be able to ultimately understand how products are performing across time and actually use that information from across time to right-size indications in a smart way. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks.